Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to this event, part of a distinguished lecture series focusing on Nobel Prize winners. I am Professor David Mba, the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise at the Montford University in Leicester. This lecture series, initiated by Professor Parvez Harris, has been running for three years and was based on the firm belief that Nobel Prize winners, esteemed individuals, can be engaged to promote greater interest in science and education. And this cannot be more so for an institution like ours, where widening participation is key to our ethos of supporting social mobility. Making these prized individuals more accessible to our students and researchers and the general public will certainly create greater appreciation of science and also inspire the next generation of leading scientists and hopefully, hopefully one day a Nobel Prize winner. We have already held three lectures in this series. The first was by Sir Paul Nurse, a Nobel Prize winner in medicine. The second lecture was by Nobel Prize winner Sir Gregory Winter, a Nobel Prize winner for chemistry. The third was Sir Richard Henderson, who's a Nobel Prize winner for chemistry. And today we have our fourth Nobel Prize winner, Sir Dr. Richard Roberts, a fellow of the Royal Society who was awarded the Nobel Prize in medicine. So we're really, really honored and appreciative of the time of Sir Richard Roberts. I'm very much thankful for the time he's given us this afternoon. And I really actually look forward to hearing very much the lecture of, about bacteria. Well, I will now invite Professor Pavez Harris to introduce Richard and I'll pass on to Pavez. Once again, thank you very much for joining us and I'm sure you'll enjoy today's lecture. Thank you, David, for the introduction and uh, this series of uh, lectures we are having at the Montfort University is uh, quite unique. And the whole idea is to uh, make these great uh, scientists, Nobel Prize winners, more accessible to our students uh, and to the whole community so that uh, they can inspire them, encourage them, so more people get engaged in science and carry out scientific research, study science, and take general interest in science. So it really is a great honor to have uh, Sir Richard uh, Roberts coming and agreeing to make a presentation to our staff, students, and the wider community in Leicester. So uh, I would like to start off by giving some background to uh, Sir Richard uh, Roberts. Uh, and this is a slide which shows some of his credentials. Obviously, there are so many things that I could have included, and, and his um, track record is actually second to none. And so many things he has done over the years that you know, and, you know, I will need to have a full lecture on the, on his credentials. But I just summarized some of the key points that I felt were important to know. And one of those things is that actually he's from the East Midlands, where we are based. De Montfort University is in the East Midlands, and so he was born here, and uh, he is currently the chief scientific officer at New England Bio Labs in the USA. He did his PhD. Uh, in organic chemistry uh, from Sheffield University back in 1968. And then he moved on to the USA where he pursued uh, postdoctoral research. And it was his research on the transcription in adenovirus 2 that led to the discovery of split genes and messenger RNA splicing in 1977. And it is for that work that he received the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1993. And he has continued to be active in research and um, other aspects of uh, life, including promoting humanitarian causes and justice uh, in society. So he's been involved in organizing a number of novel initiatives to correct scientific misunderstandings, for example. So he's uh, doing a lot of activity, uh, not in the lab only, but also beyond uh, outside in, in the community and around the world. And so he's an amazing uh, personality, in my opinion. So uh, we are really lucky to have uh, Sir Richard Roberts coming and making a presentation, not physically maybe, but he's agreed to make a presentation to us online. 
So uh, it's, it really is a great honor. And in the next slide, um, I just wanted to show something about, next slide, please. So I'll go to the next slide, uh, which is here. And if you look at this slide, uh, I put a title up uh, because nowadays with COVID-19, we are so much, you know, exposed to the word kill, kill, and kill. Uh, it's about killing the bacteria, killing the viruses, um, and all over, whether you go and see posters or whether you see products uh, promoted in the television, you see, you will always hear something about 99.9% .9 of viruses and bacteria are killed and wiped out and so forth. So there are some example pictures I've taken from the, uh, from the internet. It shows uh, different um, products that are used for killing bacteria and viruses. And they're very, you know, sort of clear in indicating like the one on the left, you can say it says 99.99% of bacteria and viruses can be killed. So when uh, Sir Richard, when I approached Sir Richard Roberts for making a presentation at the Montfort University, he gave me a series of titles that, uh, that he said he would be happy to make presentations on. And one of the titles was actually um, the one about why I love bacteria. And I thought that was the one that I was going to select, especially because of the fact that uh, we are going through the COVID-19 crisis and killing is one of the main themes that people are promoting in terms of uh, killing bacteria and viruses. And uh, looking through some of the quotes of Sir Richard Roberts, and I was quite pleased to find one, uh, which was actually in an article in Nature, where he says, um, if I were to kill all the bacteria that live in or on you, you would probably die. It is as simple as that. Uh, we know this because bacteria-free individuals of other species die young. So he clearly feels bacteria are important to us. Not all bacteria are har uh, harmful. There are many bacteria that are on us, in us, that are extremely valuable for us. So it was actually something that I asked when I was communicating with uh, Sir Richard Roberts. I asked him um, if one day someone may present a lecture entitled, Why I Love Viruses? And his response to this question was, immediate response actually was, why not? we discover RNA splicing by working on an adenovirus. So he was quite forthright in stating that even viruses have a role. And in this uh, light, I have um, a nice little article that I found in the BBC, very recent one actually, uh, during the COVID-19 period, where they've produced a nice uh, sort of uh, popular article, uh, which is entitled, Why the World Needs Viruses to Function? And what will happen if all the viruses disappeared. So this is quite an appropriate uh, subject. And so I'm really, really excited to listen to the presentation by Sir Richard. And without further ado, I would like to uh, ask him to make his presentation and enlighten us as to why uh, he loves bacteria. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much. I, I hope you can hear me successfully. <clears throat> So what I'm going to do in this talk is to tell you a little bit about the wide variety of bacteria that exist on Earth. I'll talk a little bit about the bacteria that um, cause disease and the ones that have got them a bad name. And then I'll finish on a much more optimistic note. So I think the first thing to realize is that bacteria are everywhere that they, you cannot go anywhere on this planet and not find them. But because they're very small, you usually don't see them. When you look at the tree of life, you see that bacteria on the top left occupy quite a lot of life and they're quite removed. The length of the line from say one species to another or down to the eukarya uh, really is quite long so that we are related to pretty much everything on Earth because bacteria and or archaea came first and everything else evolved from them. But there are very large numbers of bacteria. They're quite different one from another. They have lots of different properties. I want to start off with some of the early ones and I think they offer a lesson for us. So Anabina is a microorganism that lives in water. It was one of the original occupants of life on Earth. And it had the unfortunate property that when it was first formed, 
it was strictly anaerobic. It couldn't live in the presence of oxygen. However, what it did was to consume CO2 and other things and put oxygen into the atmosphere. And it is this bacterium that actually has made life possible for us because it did oxygenate the atmosphere. Now, along the way, Anabina would be dead um, were it not for the fact that it worked out how to <coughs> live in the presence of all of this oxygen that it really didn't like. And that's a separate story. It's a long one, which I don't have time to go into today. Now, another very interesting organism is one called, or <coughs> it's a group called Mixobacteria. These are the bacteria that live on rotten wood, rotten plants. If you go into forests, <coughs> you see lots of them. And they have little fruiting bodies shown here in which they spread spores and spread around. And they're really quite beautiful. If um, you got a bowl of these in your house, um, you might think that these were flowers. A very interesting other organism that I like a lot is Aquaspirillum. And this is a little marine bacterium. And it has the very interesting property. If you look in the middle of the screen, there's a long black area within the bacterial cell wall that is actually a magnet. And this magnet allows the aquaspirillium to orient itself with respect to the Earth's magnetic field, and it uses it to then go seeking food. Who would have guessed that a bacterium would be one of the first organisms to produce a magnet. Now, another very interesting area where we see lots and lots of bacteria are the hot thermal vents that we find underneath the oceans. These are areas where the magma from the center of the earth makes its way up into the oceans and produces things called black smokers, which are really chimneys through which the smoke from the magma comes. And around it, it forms rocks. There are organisms that live around it. It, within a very short period of time, the temperature goes from 350 degrees centigrade down to 20. And by the time you get to 20, not only are there bacteria living there, but there are also these organisms called tube worms. And these tube worms are actually rather interesting. They're eukaryotes, but they depend upon bacteria for everything that they do. So they're really just big containers for bacteria. And it is the bacteria that produce the energy necessary for the tube worms to exist. Now, in addition to the hot vents, there are also many geothermal pools, geothermal areas around on Earth. And these areas um, often have a set of very interesting bacteria. They have bacteria that live at high temperature, they also have bacteria that are phototrophs, shown here in green, and that really can take light and can use the light in order to make the energy that they need in order to survive. You see the brown ones are organisms that have a lot of iron in them. And so everywhere you go, you find this tremendous diversity of bacteria. They're all over the place. Even here, in one of the sulfur-rich hot springs in Yellowstone National Park, you find organisms called sulfur lobus. They are the disgusting looking yellow pit that is full of sulfur. And they are actually archaea. Archaea are a separate branch of life, as you will have seen on the earlier slide. And even here, we have organisms typically living between 30 degrees centigrade up to 65 or 70 degrees centigrade that have very interesting properties. And so this just gives you some idea of the environmental presence of bacteria, things that you never even knew were there. Um, these are not things that we see unless we start to study them and we go in with a microscope so that we can see what is going on. Now I want to talk now a little bit about humans and bacteria because I know a lot of you are very interested in this. And you have to consider that a typical human has about 10 to the 13 cells. That's quite a lot. But bacteria, there are between 10 to the 13 and 10 to the 14 bacteria in a typical human. 
Humans are just one strain. Bacteria have more than 20,000. And it is these bacteria that live with us that really allow us to live. They provide the food, many of the nutrients that we need, because as soon as we eat, hot, down goes the, the food and the bacteria start to consume it. And then they produce elements and compounds that we need in order to live. The total number of bases, DNA bases in the human genome is about 3 billion. In bacteria, pretty much the same, something like 3 billion. But the difference is, based upon my discovery back in 1977, is that in humans, because of RNA splicing and because of the presence of a lot of genes um, that do, do not code for proteins, that there are relatively few genes. There are, a good guess is about 23,000 genes that are necessary for a human to live, whereas the bacteria that live with us have more than a million. Their diversity is enormous. Now, if we look at the representative microorganisms that we find in the normal flora of humans, on the skin, your skin is actually crawling with bacteria. Um, Staphylococcus are very common, Carinobacterium are common, and so on. Many, many organisms live on our skin, and naturally because we come into contact with the environment for the most part through our skin. In the mouth, there are loads of organisms, streptococci, lactobacilli, and so on. And again, these organisms thrive on the food that we eat uh, and the drink that we consume. When you get into the respiratory tract, again, lots of different species and, and genera of bacteria are present. The gastrointestinal tract is loaded with them. The urogenital tract is loaded with them too. And so everywhere you go, you find that there are bacteria that form a key part of our body. One thing always worth knowing is that if you look at the stomach, the area where our food gets consumed, there are many bacteria there who, that help with the consumption of the food. And in fact, it is the compounds, the chemical compounds that they produce when in the stomach that get to the stomach, either from the gastrointestinal tract or from the stomach itself, that actually allow the bacteria to communicate with our brain. The brain has more connections to the stomach than to any other organ in our body. That is something that we don't understand very well, but we're starting to find out that one of the things that is going on in our bodies is that these bacteria do talk to us, they talk to our brain, they affect how our brain operates. We want to know more about this because there are connections to Alzheimer's disease and others um, that are suggested by this. Now bacteria, get a lot of bad publicity. And this is the reason why. And I want to go through and tell you a little bit about it. The thing to remember is that we tend to know a lot about things that we study and not very much about things that we don't study. In the case of bacteria, it was learned fairly early on in the history of bacteriology that there were organisms that caused disease. And Robert Koch is one of the founders of this area, and he was the first person to discover that the disease anthrax, which was a big problem, was caused by a microbacterium called Bacillus anthracis. As you go down this list, you can see loads of awful things that you really don't want to ever come across, um, tuberculosis, cholera, tetanus, and so on. And for many of these, we now have vaccines. And so the chances of our getting them are very low. But even so, there are plenty that still exist. And I have at this point to make a pitch for vaccination. Anybody who does not get vaccinated without a good medical cause is a fool. It is really important to get vaccinated, especially at these times with COVID running around the globe 
vaccination is the key, very important. It's probably the best medicine that we have ever invented. Now I'll tell you about some of the ind individual bacteria. Helicobacter pylori is one of the great triumphs of bacteriology. This is an organism that lives in your stomach, lives in extremely acidic environment in your stomach. And it was discovered by Barry Marshall and Robin Warren, who won the Nobel Prize for this discovery, that it is the cause of ulcers in the stomach. And they had a hard time convincing the world that this was true because the pharmaceutical industry liked nothing better than to sell antacids to cure ulcers in the stomach. When in fact, what you need is an antibiotic to kill Helicobacter pylori. And at that point, you no longer have the ulcer problems in, in the stomach. In the West, we typically have consumed so many antibiotics that Helicobacter is quite rare. But if you go to the developing world um, where antibiotic use is much less, Helicobacter is very prevalent. It infects lots and lots of people. And it also has one very unfortunate property associated with it. And that is that it's one of the few bacteria that can cause cancer. Um, it causes both stomach cancer. It can cause gastroesophageal cancer. And there is a big study underway at the National Cancer Institute, of which I am a part of this study, looking at Helicobacter from around the world to find out why it causes gastric cancer. Who is susceptible? Is there something about the Helicobacter strains that makes some more likely to produce cancer than others? Now, another interesting organism is the causative agent of Lyme disease. It's called Borrelia burgdorferi. It is carried by ticks, and so if you ever go out into the woods, which I'm sure many of you do from time to time, you should always be a little bit concerned about being bitten by a tick and picking up a tick because the Borrelia um, will get inside you if the tick is there for too long. And so it's always important to check yourself for ticks and make sure that they're all disposed of uh, before you go back and continue with your life. This lesion that you see, the, the big round red spot, um, only lasts for a short period of time. And once the infection is getting underway, the symptoms on the skin, this, this lesion on the skin disappears, and the Borrelia makes itself into, the ner into your nervous system, and there can be quite devastating. And it's very important that you catch it early. It can be solved with antibiotics, but they take a relatively long time to work. Sometimes as long as six, eight months of treatment are necessary to get rid of it. And this is the organism, Borrelia burgdorferi, that causes it. And as you can see, it's a long spiral bacterium that actually looks quite nice when you look at it. It looks like a, a funny sort of worm, uh, but I assure you this is not something that you want to pick up if you can avoid it. Now, another disease that was and still is quite important is Vibrio cholera, the cause of cholera. This organism is a small bacterium. It's a marine bacterium. It lives in every ocean floating around, and it is something that easily gets into the water supply. And when it does, and then it's infectious and can cause all sorts of problems. But in the areas where it lives, typically there is this eukaryotic organism, Volvox, that lives with it. And it turns out that Vibrio quite likes to hang out with Volvox, and it will stick to Volvox. And this led Rita Colwell, who used to be the head of NSF, to discover that there was actually a very easy way of purifying drinking water um, and this was important in Bangladesh, where the ladies wear these beautiful tight-knit saris, very tightly woven saris. And if you take the water that you're going to drink and filter it through the sari first, because of Vibrio's propensity to stick to Volvox, 
the Volvox will not go through the silk in the sari. And so this was a way of purifying the water by filtration and not getting rid of the bacteria directly, but indirectly because it liked to hang out with Volvox. And this turned out to be really an important discovery and has made a big difference to people in areas where Vibrio is common, where it shows up regularly um, and without the access typically to antibiotics that are necessary to solve it. Another interesting organism I always like to mention is Clostridium botulinum. Um, this causes botulism. It's a very nasty disease, and yet it produces uh, a toxin, botulina toxin, that for some reason ladies think is actually quite useful. And they use it to put it into their lips and to put it elsewhere to enhance that feature. In very low doses, botulina toxin is okay, uh, but if you get a nasty infection with it, it is really not so good. It is something that it is much better to avoid if you get the chance. Another disease caused by an organism called rickettsia is interesting because here is a, a, a bacterium that lives not free living out by itself, but it lives inside human cells. And it gets into the cell and produces, um, replicates there and causes this disease called rickettsia. Um, it's one of the few, there are not a lot of organisms that live inside human cells, there are a few, um, but this is one of them that is disease causing. Treponema denticola, it's a bit of a giveaway from the denticola. Um, this is an organism, a nice spiral organism, a good looking little thing. It lives in your mouth and it causes dental caries, among other things. Um, again, this is something that one should try to avoid, um, which is why we brush our teeth as often as we do. Um, but nevertheless, it is a widespread organism. Yersinia pestis is well known in England and in throughout Europe because this was the cause of the plague during the Middle Ages, where it killed as much as 90% of the population in many areas. It's a, a very nasty disease. Uh, plague is not something that you want to get involved with if you can avoid it. But fortunately, it can be treated with, with um, antibiotics. But the key there is always to get first, as soon as possible, antibiotics into the system. It's carried by rats, among other animals, and it's still common in the US. If you go out into Arizona, New Mexico, and so on, um, there is still plenty of Yersinia pestis going around. Um, you get these typical buboes, these bumps um, that are a little unpleasant. Or if you have very severe disease, it will affect your fingernails and produce this gangrene in the fingers. But doctors in the Arizona, New Mexico, um, western part of the US, when someone comes in with the initial bubo and they have picked it up, they know what it is immediately and they give you an antibiotic. However, occasionally you find out there's been a traveler from Arizona who was infected has gone to New York City to enjoy the city as a tourist, are not aware. They, they see the bubo, they see a doctor, the doctor doesn't know what it is. And so this is a problem. They don't get properly treated sometimes to start off with. So that's still a problem, uh, but much less than it used to be. Uh, and this is the organism, the little bacterium that causes it. Um, you can see that there are little tiny I guess orange, you would call them, um, little orange bacteria that are the cause of this disease. Again, something to avoid. And especially if you were still back in the Middle Ages, you would definitely want to avoid this. Now, with all of that said, <coughs> the organisms that I've just been talking about are the ones that we really are not very happy to see around. And so we've developed medicines to solve the problems that they cause. We've developed vaccines. And so, for instance, in the West, tuberculosis is almost never seen anymore. 
uh, measles is not seen, syphilis and so on, none of these diseases are seen anymore because we have vaccines or we have very good treatments. We know how to treat them through antibiotics and so on. But that also leads me to raise a cautionary note in that we have to be a little bit careful about the use of antibiotics. We tend to think that this is just a panacea for any bacterial disease and that we really should be taking antibiotics in a regular basis. Many parents will have a child who's got a, a disease. They, they have a cold, they may have something relatively simple. They go to the doctor and the doctor says, oh, you know, it, it's just a virus. Take your child home, um, keep them comfortable, give them lots of drinks, give them lots of love, and they will soon get over it because our uh, medications for viral diseases are pretty limited. But instead, the parent will say, oh, I need an antibiotic. And they, they want to give their child something because they think this is going to help them without realizing that antibiotics are useless against viruses. And so I think doctors have often responded to patients by giving antibiotics when they really weren't necessary uh, but really as a, a placebo for the parent rather than a treatment for the child. And this is something that we really need to avoid. We really need to make sure that we only take antibiotics when absolutely necessary and under no circumstances should we overuse them. And the reason for that is shown on this slide. You have to realize that the bacteria that live with us have made us their home. They want us to be well. They want us to be safe so that nothing happens to their home. They don't want anything bad to happen. And so what do we typically do when we buy a home? Well, we put up a fence and we buy an alarm system to scare off anybody who might come and to warn us if something bad is going to happen. And bacteria have essentially done the same thing. They have gone out of their way to make sure that we are as healthy as we possibly can be. And if we do things that kill them, then we affect our own health, not just the disease that we were trying to protect against. And so one of the things they do is they protect us from pathogens. They actually produce antibiotics and they produce chemicals that will kill pathogens themselves very often. We've even discovered recently that they are not very happy when we get cancer. And so they produce agents that will kill cancer cells. This is, these are very recent findings. And it's likely that as we explore this area more, we're going to find out a lot more. Remember, I told you it was at the end of the 19th century when the microbiologists were busy studying all of the bacteria that cause disease. Now we're in an age where within just the last 10 or 15 years, we've discovered that there are so many good bacteria, so many that help us, that want to take care of us. And this is a big area of study at the moment. It's called the microbiome. It's the microbes that live with us, that help us, that want to keep us safe. There are things called probiotics, things that help the bacteria. Um, I think there are many, many um, organisms, lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, even helicobacter, that are actually our friends. And we want to keep them around. And we want to make sure that they're properly fed, that they're well fed, and that things go well with them, that they can live successfully. One of the things that is very good are these probiotics that you can buy. And it turns out yogurt is very, very good as a probiotic because it contains lactobacillus and lactobacillus is really very good for us. So do eat yogurt. I, I have to admit, I'm not talking about myself because I'm not a fan of yogurt, but many people are, and it is incredibly good for you. 
Uh, my wife spends a lot of time trying to persuade me that I should be eating yogurt. Um, but I, I figure I'm helping my own microbiome in other ways. One of the things, one of the organisms that you find in yogurt is something called Lactobacillus sarcae. Lactobacillus sarcae is a very nice organism, totally harmless, um, and really is very helpful for our health. It does a lot of good things for us. And some years ago, um, people were trying to improve the lactobacillus that was present in yogurt. And in particular, Nestle's company in Switzerland came up with an improved version of lactobacillus called lactobacillus johnsoni that if present in yogurt really improved its ability to help our microbiome and to take care of the bugs that live with us. Now, they were gung-ho for doing this. They were ready to put it into a product and to start serving it. But of course, um, in Europe, anything that has been genetically engineered is considered very bad. And for reasons that I will talk about at the very end of this talk for a few minutes is the anti-GMO movement because one of the things that arose from it is that the lactobacillus johnsonii, which would have greatly improved yogurt, Nestle stopped research on it. And they stopped research because they were afraid that if they continued with it, that they would get a, a bad name, that they would get the activists out accusing them of making genetically modified organisms. And so they shut down that line of research completely. And I think that is very unfortunate. It's something that I hope will get picked up again because we need to get better probiotics. We need to get to find ways that we can improve our microbiome. And a good reason for that is because every time we take an antibiotic, we kill a lot of the bacteria that normally live with us and that we need in order to keep us healthy. I also want to tell you a little story about an organism called Clostridium difficile. I'm glad to say I've never worked with this organism myself, and I hope never to come into contact with it, but I have done a lot of bioinformatic work on it. It's a very interesting organism in that it is difficult to kill, and it has become over the years increasingly resistant to almost every antibiotic we can throw at it. Now, it doesn't kill you. Rather, what it does is to produce uh, very uncomfortable symptoms of which the worst is uncontrolled diarrhea. Now, you can imagine that this is a bit of a problem. When you first get C. diff, as they call it, um, you have uncontrolled diarrhea, but you're usually in hospital because it turns out hospitals are the place where C. diff really is very widespread, very easy to pick up if you're not careful. Now, C. diff, it turns out it escapes antibiotic treatment very often by forming spores. That is, spores are one part of a bacterial life that is resistant to everything because the organism has stopped growing. The organism forms a little hard-shelled um, version of itself. It doesn't do anything other than to monitor its environment, which takes almost no energy. And it just sits and waits until the environment is ready for it to grow again. Now, with C. diff, this is a problem. It means that you lose the symptoms for a while, while you're in hospital, maybe while you're being treated. But then when you go home, it comes back again and you have this uncontrolled diarrhea and it makes life very difficult for patients who get it. Now, I had a very long talk with a doctor at Mass General Hospital who had been treating C. diff and she had found some ways of really trying to control C. diff um, and she came up with something which she called casugel capsules. 
Um, they contain compounds that will help to get rid of C. diff. Um, and you take them as a pill. But the problem was when they were first made, the pills were translucent. And if you look at it, um, they do not look particularly good, um, but they minimize the risk of a bad aftertaste. Now, I want to close out this talk, um, first of all, by talking about bacteria, where they occur and where they might occur other than on Earth. We don't actually know how bacteria arose on Earth. The best estimates are that when the Earth was in its early stages, some three and a half billion years ago, slowly the chemical compounds that were present in the Earth's core that were coming to the surface um, were formed in little pools eventually allowed something that looked like life to grow. And that over time, these compounds, these pools of compounds, formed a very primitive form of life that was able to replicate. Because it is replication that is really the absolute key to life. This is how you know something is alive, is because it can replicate by itself. Now, the conditions on Earth that allowed life to get going are also replicated in planets all over the solar system and, in fact, throughout the universe. If it could happen here, it obviously could happen anywhere. Now, there's a lot of research going on to try and, and find out what it was that was key to allow life to get going in the first place. A good friend of mine, Jack Shostak, who is also a Nobel Prize winner, is down at Mass General Hospital, and he has spent a lot of time trying to work out how the initial chemical reactions might take place. And as I said, if they can take place here, they can take place on any planet. And one of the planets that um, we're looking at rather closely at the moment is our neighbor, Mars. And in fact, the very latest mission that has just gone to Mars, among other things, is looking for signs of rudimentary life on Mars. And I have to tell you that it is my hope that they, in fact, find life on Mars and that inevitably it will be bacterial because the atmosphere is so poor and even here on Earth, we know that you can go three miles down below the surface and still find bacterial life. And so perhaps on Mars, there are also remnants of bacterial life. And if we can find it and determine its DNA sequence, we may determine that it's actually older than life on Earth, that perhaps life did in fact get started on Mars, but then moved to Earth as a result of, say, asteroids hitting the planet, comets, things hitting Mars, transferring life here, because we know there is Martian material on Earth. It's been found and discovered. And think about it. If, in fact, life is present on Mars and it's older than life on Earth, then we're really all Martians. And I would like to die thinking that that was still a possibility, but perhaps one that has already been achieved. So I, I will close my talk on bacteria about that. But before I go, I want to tell you about something else that I had mentioned briefly earlier and that I think is very important and is especially important for an audience in Europe. And, you know, Britain is still a part of Europe despite Brexit. One of the things that has happened is that there has been a massive campaign against GMOs. Um, and this came about because Greenpeace were looking for some issue um, that they could get involved in. And in the early days, they latched on to GMOs as being something that could be very useful for fundraising. 
GMO technology involves a way of breeding new organisms, in particular breeding new plants, and introducing traits that are really desirable for plants. And in so doing, we take genes from organisms that are not the native plant, but from elsewhere, but just a single gene or a couple of genes, moving into a plant in order to make that plant have a better yield, have better agricultural properties or whatever. But pest resistance is really a major source uh, of this. This is something that's really important. We spend huge amounts of money, lots of time polluting this earth with pesticides that the plants, if they could produce the pesticides themselves, we wouldn't then need to be destroying the planet in this way. So I organized a campaign a few years ago. We now have 158 Nobel laureates who've all signed on to it, saying and urging every country, every single country, to acknowledge that GMO technology is basically safe. The science is in, the science says for sure this technology is safe. If anything, it's safer than the traditional ways in which we breed plants. And while for Europe, this is not yet a problem, it is going to become a problem as the Earth's climate warms. The plants that we typically grow to feed ourselves do not grow as well in different higher temperature environments. We're going to need to be able to make the crops that we eat survive these higher temperatures. And when we do that, then the easiest way to do it is to use GMO technology because it is fast, it's safe, and allows us to do things that we cannot do by conventional breeding. This is especially true in the developing world, though, because in the developing world, there has been a tremendous amount of effort gone in to stopping them using GMOs. And this has been caused by the Europeans who didn't like them. And they've now gone out really serving as missionaries against GMOs in the developing world. And I like this cartoon to illustrate the dichotomy. Um, if you've got a, a biotech food, which um, Greenpeace decided they should call Franken foods to scare everybody, um, they were telling this person is telling this little boy, um, do you know what this GM food can do for you? And the little boy is rather sensible. He's hungry. And he says, yes, it can help keep me alive. And I think we need to get over this anti-GMO sentiment. We need to acknowledge the science and agree that the GMO methods are safe. And we need to make sure they get widely disseminated in the developing world where there has been very little attempt to improve crops in the way that has been successfully done in the West. And I hope you will all get on board with this. If you go to this site, the supportprecisionagriculture.org, it's the Nobel Prize winner's site where we support this campaign. Great deal of information about what's gone on. There are lectures that I've given on this topic, um, but you can sign on and join the Nobel laureates and supporters because there are very few issues that are more important to the developing world at the moment. And I think if Europe thinks it's got an immigration problem at the moment, with the rate of increase of population in Africa, without a concomitant increase in the food supply, uh, people are going to be moving north. And Europe is going to end up with a massive immigration problem, much more than they have today. So at this point, I would like to close. I'd encourage you to look at this, but also I hope you will take to heart the message that I've given about bacteria. The bacteria are our friends. They should be your friends. They're my friends. They keep us alive. Without a good, healthy microbiome, we will all die. If we kill all of the bacteria that live with us, we will die, as was said right at the beginning of this talk. Let's not do that. Let's take good care of our bacteria and let's all love them. Thank you. 
Thanks very much indeed, Rich, for this uh, wonderful and fascinating lecture. I think uh, we all enjoyed it very much. And uh, it was an amazing journey uh, showing the dangerous bacteria that we have around us and also the very friendly bacteria that we have that are so helpful to us as well at the same time. So uh, we have some uh, time for questions and answers. Uh, and we do have uh, quite a number of questions coming through the from the audience. And to begin with, I would like to ask you a question. I mean, uh, in Europe, for example, we have uh, actually removed many animals that used to be here, for example, wolves and so on. So we've actually killed off uh, animals that used to actually be in, in this continent. Uh, do you know of any, any, any bacteria that have become extinct as a consequence of overuse of medications, drugs, vac uh, antibiotics and so forth? Is well, there a similar situation? Yeah, I mean, I think one example that I actually referred to is Helicobacter pylori, um, which most people in developing countries no longer have um, Helicobacter pylori. They may, you may find a few people that have them, but a lot of people don't, whereas in the developing world, um, they're really important. And even though they're able to cause ulcers, they're able to cause cancer, overall, they're beneficial for us. And there is some good epidemiological evidence suggesting that provided they don't get out of control, they can be good for us. And it may be that there have been other organisms that we've gotten rid of, uh, but we never discovered them ahead of time. And so I can't answer that question properly, I'm afraid. Sure, thanks very much. Uh, we have a number of questions which focus on the use of antibiotics. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions um, being asked is that once the antibiotics kill the bad guys, they will also end up killing the good guys as well. Yeah. So how do you uh, manage to uh, sort of reconcile these two issues? So when you have a disease for which we have a good antibiotic, um, very often the antibiotics that will treat the disease um, can be sufficiently specific that they will not cause too much damage to the rest of our microbiome. But the single most important thing is don't overuse them. So use them in order to get rid of the bad bacteria that you don't want. The good bacteria often have good hiding places. Um, they, they find ways to avoid the antibiotics or they've already become resistant um, because we typically give children way more antibiotics than we probably should. Um, but really, the answer to that question is more research and finding ways to restore the microbiome when we think it's going to run into trouble. And so I think medicines in the future, when we're treating diseases that antibiotics can deal with, we will give the antibiotic, finish it, and then give whatever is necessary to re replenish the microbiome. And I will give you one example where that in effect is already taking place, but not in a disease context. So very often ladies have cesarean operations to deliver babies. It turns out that if you do that, the microbes that live in a lady's vagina do not get onto the baby because a natural birth, the way in which the microbiome gets started is during passage through the birth canal. And so what some doctors have been doing is when a cesarean baby is born, that they take vaginal swabs and coat the baby in it to try to recreate the process of natural birth through the birth canal. And the reason that's important is because long studies have shown that babies born by cesarean section are not as healthy as babies that are born by natural birth. Sure, thanks sure. very much indeed. Uh, one question that I would like to ask you is, uh, we have the microbiome, and which is now being seen as an important, uh, important for human health, and there is a link between the, the brain and the gut, and you, you mentioned about Alzheimer's disease. Uh, is there any studies that has been done to show that, uh, that a microbiome that has been damaged uh, is actually the cause for development of some of these neurodegenerative disease? Um, I don't know of any. So you have to realize this is still a very hot research area. It's one that's not been studied for 
sort of many, many years. There are ongoing studies, um, not just with Alzheimer's, with Parkinson's, with other diseases, that are making it look as though there is some link. Um, but first of all, we need to show for sure that there, there is a link, and then we need to get back to the ultimate cause of it. And we're not yet at that position. I think we, within the next few years, we will be, and we will know much more about this. But at the moment, um, the, the, on, the studies are still ongoing. It's too early to reach definite conclusions. Sure, we have more questions. It would be surprising if, if that was not the case. Sure, thank you. Uh, we have another question, which is about, uh, you know, uh, Patricia Parrish is asking a question about, can you suggest further reading and guidance on foods that encourage good gut bacteria? And actually, uh, that relates to a question that I had, because your wife, uh, you know, loves your gut, but you don't. And you said you managed to, you know, maintain your microbiome in other ways. So perhaps mm -hmm. you can share some light and some information to us so those who do not like yogurt or milk products can still maintain their microbiome. Yeah, I, I think there are um, probably lots of good sources for this, but I'm not an expert in this area and I've not read a great deal myself that I would recommend to other people. Um, part of the problem is there's a lot of sort of anecdotal evidence that, well, if you eat this, it's good. If you eat that, it's good. Uh, I think I always go to the NCBI website um, and to PubMed and to look in the scientific literature when I want to find out about this area. Um, but I don't know off the top of my head of any popular books that really uh, deal with this issue directly. I'm sure they exist. They're just not known to me. And so I hesitate to, to start recommending things. So there, thanks, uh, thanks, Rich. Uh, another question is about your final slide, which was about GMOs. And uh, uh, there is actually two questions. One of them is from Roger, uh, who is asking, how can we prevent dangerous GMOs being developed by uh, malevolent individuals? Well, I think the only way we do that is the way that we stop malevolent individuals from making nuclear bombs. Um, the bottom line is, unfortunately, we live in a society where there are malevolent individuals. But I think to really think about making GMOs deliberately to be dangerous, um, we're talking about terrorist groups, we're talking about individuals who are against society for one reason or another, and the bottom line is we cannot stop them. There, there is no good way to stop them other by surveillance and try to spot them before they get too far with this. Um, but it is not going to be that easy to make GMOs that are dangerous. But I could ask the same thing, you know, um, there is a, a natural crop that produces a very dangerous toxic chemical called ricin. Um, that plant could be crossed with almost anything to make something produce ricin. You don't need GMO methods for this. You, you can do it by regular breeding methods. Um, how do we stop that? Well, the bottom line is so far, no one's decided that was a good way to go and no one's decided it's a good thing to do. So ultimately, it is governments that have to put in surveillance in order to stop these kinds of things. But to suggest that the companies, the agri big agribusinesses that are doing this um, would be doing it is nonsense. Um, they're just not going to do it. They're going to do things that will improve crops and will make life better for all of us. And the nice thing is with the GMO approaches, they're cheap, they're fast, they're easy to do in the developing countries. Um, we don't need big agribusiness to do it in order to help the developing countries. They can do it themselves. So I think we're coming to an end, but I think uh, we'll have one, other, one or two questions if possible. One of them is from Helena. Uh, she's asking actually a question about those undergoing necessary but damaging treatments such as chemotherapy. Are there any ways to protect the microbiome? Um, that is beyond my level of expertise, I'm afraid. I'm sure there must be some ways to do this. Uh, but the chemotherapy typically are using drugs that target human cells and don't target the bacteria. And I've never actually heard of any microbiome problems as a result of chemotherapy. Um, maybe there, there have been some, but they've not come to my attention. And they're certainly not something that is widely spoken about. And so because of the nature of the chemotherapy, which targets human cells, 
I think it unlikely um, that it's going to cause great damage to the microbiome. Thanks very much, Rich. Unfortunately, you do not have enough time to um, address some of the other questions because we are running out. Uh, I would like to thank well, you once. Could I suggest something? Yes, if, please. If people have questions, just email me. I, I'm very yeah, good yeah. at responding to emails. My email address is roberts at neb, New England Biolabs.com. So just Thanks, send yeah. your questions to me directly. Yes, so anyone who has some outstanding questions to be answered, please contact Rich. Uh, once again, thanks very much, Rich, for um, taking your time out and presenting this wonderful lecture and uh, you know, being highly enthusiastic about the research that you've done and uh, amazing work that you are doing. And we are really, really pleased for your presentation. I would like to also thank uh, David for introducing the session and all the audience uh, from around the world, actually, who are taking part in this event. And I hope you'll come back and visit the Montfort University Leicester when everything becomes normal uh, once again. So once again, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That sounds like a good idea. Thanks very much. Okay. Take care and wish you, you all the best. Thanks very thank much. You bye very bye. Much. Enjoy thank your you. weekend. Yeah, same with you. Bye bye. Okay, bye bye. Take care.